Hey everybody, it's Frankie and Pat from Engine Power, and today we're going to talk about a topic we get a ton of questions about, that is degreeing cams. We're going to show you why you need to do it, what you need to do it, and how to do it. It's a tech talk. The first question is, why degree the cam at all? If you line the dots up, it should be right. Well, that's not always the case. Machining tolerances are different from component to component, so things move around. The reason we want to degree a cam, our cams are very specific to where things happen in the engine, meaning valve events. Engine builders want valve events to happen at specific times depending on the application. So putting the intake center line in relationship to where the crank is, is very important and there's a lot to it. Yeah, there's a lot of specs when it comes to cams, but what you're mostly concerned with is that intake center line. But all those other specs on an aftermarket cam usually come with it on something called a cam card. This is a piece of paper that gives you all the information about your cam and its lobes, durations, lifts, and even the intake opening and closing and exhaust opening and closing points at a specific intake center line. Now, a common misconception is that the intake center line that's printed on the cam card is where your cam needs to be installed. That is not the case. There are plenty of different applications that the cam manufacturer does not know. They can't account for your specific combination, and it is up to you as the engine builder when you're putting the cam in to install the cam's intake center line where you want for your application. That number is simply for a reference for those opening and closing points on the card, it does not mean that that is where the cam is supposed to be in your engine. Armed with that knowledge, now we can talk about the equipment it takes to check the cam, which is degree the cam's intake center line. There are levels of affordability for all of this, just like all other equipment in engine building. We can go from the very economical to the more advanced, but if you do it a lot, it is worth the cost. First, we're going to talk about a basic kit like this one. It has a small diameter degree wheel and actually has other things that makes it a complete kit so you can just have a one-shot deal, buy it once, and then degree cams. This has a wheel, has an indicator, and has a way of attaching it to the engine at some point, either screwing it down to the block or the cylinder head, maybe the pan rail or the actual valve cover rail. Also, a lot of times these come with a test lifter on popular engines. Now, Moving up to that, we have more advanced stuff. These are more things that professionals use. Larger diameter degree wheels. Now, why would you need a larger diameter? Well, if you can see by the increments on a smaller wheel, the increments on 360 degrees are actually smaller spacing in between. The larger the degree wheel, the more those are spaced out. So the more accurate it can be and the more fine tuning that you can do when you're degreeing cam. These wheels are universal, so they have different style pucks that, depending on the size of their balancer bolt, can attach to the front of the crankshaft. And there's also more to this than just the wheels. We have to go to the top side of the engine. Yeah, for the wheel, we need a way to actually point at the wheel and tell us what number we're on, so we need some kind of indicator. We have a really nice magnetic base one with a sharp point, but if you want something more budgety, you can literally use a piece of TIG wire or coat hanger and a bolt, as long as you can fix it to the block and it's relatively stable. You don't want something that's going to move around a bunch because we don't want that to move once we get started. To set that, we're basically going to set that to true TDC, so we need a way to measure the piston's position as it comes through TDC in the bore. So you can literally do this with something like a magnetic base style indicator. We have a nice deck bridge with an indicator in it or something that's very inexpensive but works extremely well is a piston stop that goes across the top of the bore and you gently touch the piston against it in both directions. To measure the actual camshaft itself, this can get a little more expensive. If you're doing this all the time, it's kind of worth it, but they have dedicated indicator tools that actually have a couple different sizes of sleeves and these go in the lifter bore itself. It's very important to use the right end for the lifter style you're using, whether it's a roller or flat tappet, but they usually come with both styles. But if this is out of your budget, you can absolutely do this with the lifter you're using, a push rod, and a dial indicator. Again, this can be just as accurate as long as you have it set up correctly. Now that we know everything we need to degree the cam, we're going to get right into it. All right, the first part of this job is actually hooking our wheel to the engine. And we do that with a crank bolt, just like we would if we were putting the crank bolt in with the balancer. Now, you'll notice that we have a piston in there. The piston has to be in there along with a rod. Obviously, the crank and cam have to be in it so you can actually get everything to its position that we're supposed to be measuring. So we put a piston and it doesn't matter if it has rings on it or not, it just has to be in there, but it has to be on, the rod has to be on for real with bearings in it, and we have to have it 
start from somewhere. So when we put a camshaft in, initially we were going to put the cam in straight up, meaning straight up means the intake center line is equal to the exhaust center line relationship to where the crankshaft's position is. We will get to that later. The most important part is having the piston and rod in somewhere close to TDC because our numbers on our wheel have to line up to where our pointer is. Normally, if it's an iron block, we can hook our magnetic pointer on the block somewhere. This is our 509 inch all aluminum W series engine that we're doing for a project. So this engine is made out of aluminum. Since I haven't created an aluminum magnet yet, we have to have a place for our indicator to go in. So what we're gonna do is put a plate on here and stick our magnetic base pointer onto that. All right, yes, yeah, so we have our little magnetic plate here. We usually keep this around for instances just like this. And on an aluminum engine like this, you don't have to use the plate. You could absolutely use that bolt and wire that we are talking about. But we like using our little magnetic pointer because it's a little more stable. The important thing to note is once we get this set for true TDC, we don't want to move it. If it gets bumped or nudged or moved, you have to start all over because all your numbers will then be inaccurate. First thing we're gonna do is roughly set our indicator to the zero mark on our wheel. We're just gonna get it close. We know our piston's kind of close to true TDC. So we'll get that kind of close to there. And then we're gonna take our deck gauge with a dial indicator. We're gonna set it across the deck, zero it out, and then put it over top the top of the piston. So what we're trying to do is set our wheel and indicator to true TDC. But when the piston rolls through true TDC, it's really not moving up or down a lot. It's in a period called dwell, so it's very hard to measure. So a more accurate way that we do this is we pick a position before true TDC and after true TDC, we pick the same increment. So usually five or 10 thousandths down in the bore. And we're gonna take uh, readings on our wheel at those increments and then average the two and that, once we set our indicator to that, will give us the actual true TDC position of the piston in the bore. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna roll it back a little bit, come up to about five before, which is 90 on our gauge right here. We're gonna look at our increment. It's about one and a half. Then we're gonna roll through TDC and then back around to that 90 on our gauge. And we are about six and a half. So six and a half, one and a half, add them together, you get eight and then divide that by two and that is four. So if we set our pointer right now to four at this position, it will be set for true TDC on our wheels. So we'll loosen this up a little bit. Put it right over the four mark. That's one, two, three, four from zero. So now when we roll our wheel to zero, that is actually true TDC of the piston in the bore. All right, with that all solid, it's time to move on and how we follow the lifter. Now, when we do this, you can still use the lifter that you have with your build and a push rod and a dial indicator, but we are going to use a dedicated tool for this. And the reason why, we do every cam and every engine that we build. So to speed up our process, we have our specific lifter bore tool. We already have it set up for our lifter bore size, which is 842, and we have the proper follower. Again, if it's a flat tappet, you'll use the flat one. On this one, it is a radius because it is a roller cam, and it just goes right in the lifter bore, right on the lobe. Now, one thing that's very important, make sure when you start out and you're doing intake center line, make sure you put it actually on the intake lobe, because if you put it on the exhaust lobe, you're gonna get some crazy numbers, so. First thing we're going to do is zero out our lifter bore indicator for base circle. You could also try and zero it out for peak lift, but this way if you zero it out at base circle, you can also make a cam card for the engine. If you don't know the specs, you can check it for advertised duration, duration at 50 thousandths lift, uh, peak lobe lift, all that kind of stuff. So usually we'll just zero it out on, on the base circle and then we will spin it over and go for peak lift. So what we're gonna do is very similar to the piston. We're gonna try and find the center line of where the lobe is at its peak by picking points on either side of it because it's really hard to measure that period at the top where the lifter is kind of dwelling and not moving a lot. So we're gonna pick points on either side of it. And in this instance, we usually like to do a couple different points. So we'll do usually five, 10 and 15 thousandths of an inch before and after the peak lobe lift and then we'll average those numbers to find our true intake center line. 
So what we're going to do is if we know where our, roughly where our peak is, we're going to back up a little bit. An important thing to note is that when you're checking these points, you need to be turning the engine over in the direction of rotation. You can't turn it backwards because although you think the timing set might be really tight and stuff like that, there is always a little bit of clearance in there or a little bit of slack. And so we want to make sure we're doing it in the direction of rotation. So that is taken account of for. So even if you turn it backwards, just make sure you finish by turning it in the direction of rotation. So we're going to roll it up to 15 before. Right there. And then the way we're going to do it is very similar. We're going to take two numbers and then average them. On this degree wheel, we're just going to use the outside numbers. We're not even going to worry about the inside. So let's just take the straight number, which is 84. We'll roll it through peak lift and then back to that 15. Take the next number, which is 129. And then we're going to take the average of those two numbers. So we take our first number, 84, add it to our second number, 129, divide the two to get the average, 106.5. So this is our intake center line in crankshaft degrees. So what that means is that our intake center line is 106.5 degrees after top dead center. And you could repeat the exact same measuring process on the exhaust side, and that would be in degrees before top dead center. So let's put it all together. That means our cam is in seven and a half degrees advanced because we know what our lobe separation angle is. It is 114. The cam is advanced. If say that was in at 114 degrees, that means the cam will be in straight up. You've heard that term, the cam in straight up. That doesn't mean that the dots are lined up. That means that the intake and the exhaust center lines are the same distance from TDC. Now, when you advance or retard the cam, that's what builds power in different areas of the power curve. Things happen faster when the cams advance. It opens the valves faster, but it also closes them faster, so it traps air and earlier in the cylinder, and then that builds torque down low. On the other side of that, say that intake center line was in at like 116. That means it's two degrees retarded. That traps air later in the cycle, and that's usually better for high RPM and power up there. What that does is tilt the power in the curve depending on when the valves open and close. The great thing is you don't need a cam card if you have this equipment. You can make your own cam card and verify where all of your things are and then set the engine up the way you think it should be for your application. That's right. So make sure you like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you get updated about new videos like this. And if you have any questions, make sure you drop them in the comments. We'll do our best to answer them. Now go build something cool.